What's up Lazy Dog fam? Hope everybody out there is having an awesome day. It's Sunday here on the homestead. Just got back from a little weekend camping vacation a few hours away and when you're gone for a few days there's always a lot of catching up to do when you get back. So I have several things I need to do today. I'm gonna take you around with me, try to get those things knocked out. Had to wait till it cooled off a little bit this afternoon. So I took me a power nap when we got back. Now it's time to get some stuff done in the garden. Number one on the list, I need to get some trellis ran for these Supremo pickling cucumbers here. I'll tell you these and these uh, second round of summer squash we planted, I think these things tripled in size just over the weekend. Crazy how fast these things grew. We got a little bit of rain while I was gone, but these things are already putting out tendrils and we should already had a trellis up, but better late than never. Let's go get some T posts in the ground and get some trellis netting on these guys. All right, so we got our post in. All I needed was three posts for this little stretch. These rows are about 30 foot long. These cucumbers take up about half that row. So one on the end of the cucumber section or one on each end of the cucumber section and one in the middle should be plenty. Usually when I'm doing this trellis netting, anywhere from eight to 10 feet apart on the post is plenty even for some heavy stuff like cucumbers. Now there are several reasons I really like this trellis netting here for things like cucumbers and it's kind of basic trellising. Now I love my arch panel that's made out of cattle panels, but for most things I like this netting. It's just easier to set up, quicker to set up, quicker to take down, a lot of advantages to it. I could go on and on and on. But another thing that I just thought about today was the length of your rows so most cattle panels are 16 feet long and this little section is not exactly 16 feet so when you're if you're using a cattle panel you kind of got to adjust your rows to the length of those panels but this stuff here you can cut the length so i can just arbitrarily plant what looks like to be half a row here and cut this stuff to length and be just fine i don't have to worry about the panel hanging off the end of the cucumber section or anything like that so we can customize this stuff to fit whatever row length we have even if you had a little raised bed and had eight foot in there or four foot or whatever really nice we can just buy a big roll of it and cut it however we want it and we just secure this stuff with zip ties found these at the hardware store nifty colored zip ties they had all kind of different colors orange red black green i got the green ones i usually use the black ones these green ones are a little easier to see when it gets time to take this down i can cut them a little easier because i can see them you just want to make sure you stretch this stuff tight it's kind of like fishing line just cinch it tight and you're good to go and that's what she looks like when we're finished I mean, literally takes less than five minutes. So nice, just throw that up real quick. Here's what the big roll looks like. So we just fold that out and cut off of it. Now that looks like it would be a mess, but surprisingly it's not. It folds out really, really easily. Now, these guys will take to that netting pretty easily. But we can see we've got some already kind of vining out into the row here. So. I think we're going to go ahead and have to do a little training here and get these guys acclimated to climbing. Now one more good benefit to this stuff as opposed to a panel is it's a little bit flexible so it's easier to train stuff along it without tearing up the plants. With a panel you can't move those rungs there but with this you can so you can kind of fold them around it there and it's a little easier to train them initially than it is on a metal panel so that's another added advantage of this stuff in my opinion so we just kind of lean them towards it when they get long enough when we can kind of wrap them around it some of them aren't long enough yet but that's kind of how i do it right there just kind of wrap them around the bottom there and this tendril here will find that and then hopefully start climbing vertically all right got those cucumbers taken care of now it's tater time now, I'm not going to have my normal two tater helpers. They're pretty wore out from the weekend and they're inside and I'm just going to leave them in there. I got this row of Vikings right here I need to get out of here. So let me grab some buckets and I should be able to knock this out pretty quick. 
as you can see here these guys are officially toast no doubt that these are ready to be harvested kennebecs are still hanging in there a little bit those are probably be the last ones to get dug and then german butterballs are pretty close to toast we'll probably get those in the next few days now this viking is one of those varieties that i've never grown before and that would be in addition to the irish cobbler didn't have much luck with the kennebec last year because a lot of them rotted after i planted so uh, viking irish cobbler kennebec and that might have been all as far as the new varieties we planted in this plot now uh, this viking is supposed to be an improved version of a red potato we'll see how it compares to the red norland with total harvest number and taste and all that there's a pretty good one right there and i'm not i know a lot of people love there's a good one red potatoes and they're okay i don't dislike them but they're not my favorite they just don't have as much flavor as some of the other potato varieties in my opinion there's some nice ones there so we'll just see how these taste compared to the red norland i do like finding a couple of those small ones every now and then those are really good we did a low country boil this past weekend with some of those red norlands and those little ones are nice to just cook whole there we get some nice potatoes here good many per plant all right all right all right got her did had a few that had rotted on me about four or five or six right here at the front of the row and i probably left them in the ground about a week too long but losing six or so is not bad compared to what we got here folks that is a heap of taters for a 30 foot row right there i mean a lot that's the first row where i've had to go get a third bucket and uh you can see there we got two full and one about half full and we got some absolute monsters here that's my biggest one there i put it to the side to show you i think it's absolutely huge that's as big as any of them yukons we grew that one there's not a bad one either but that's the leader in the clubhouse as far as big red tater so we'll go weigh these and see what we got but just on first impressions i think this is going to be my biggest haul off a 30 foot row so far just a few small taters in there a few like that but most of them are these whoppers like that guy that guy you can see in there there's another whopper right there real nice looking good sized taters okay you just have to trust me on the readings here because you can't see the scale but let's go bucket number one 33 pounds bucket number two 35 pounds and bucket number three 17 pounds so if we add that up 33 35 and 17 that's 85 pounds of potatoes off a 30 foot row that is crazy and if we do the math there we planted five pounds of seed potatoes that gives us a 17 times multiple now i have to go back and look at the other videos to see uh, the other varieties I can't remember off the top of my head, but I know they don't come close to this. I think the, the biggest harvest we had so far was a 12 times multiple, around 60 pounds of potatoes, but 85 pounds of potatoes from five pounds of seed potatoes is just crazy. And they're right, whoever they is, the seed potato producers or whatever, when they say this is an improved red potato variety, yeah, it, even though Red Norlin did really well for us, I think we got 60 pounds of potatoes off a 30-foot row. This blew the doors off of it with 85 pounds. So a lot more productive. The potatoes are bigger. I expect they're going to taste similar. They may taste a little bit better, but they should taste at least the same. And I remember when I planted these, the seed potatoes on these were a lot bigger than the seed potatoes for the Red Norlands. And now I see why. These just make bigger potatoes. They make more of them. And um, if you like red potatoes, I'd highly recommend the Viking. Uh, you know, haven't seen any potato, much less, you know, not just a red potato, but any potato has yet to beat this guy. We still got two more varieties to harvest. We'll see how they compare, but this is by far the big winner 
yet in our potato plot at 85 pounds. All right, so that took care of the Irish taters and I put those buckets underneath the barn. I'll fool with that later, putting those on the rack. I can do that later tonight or in the morning. Now for the sweet taters. So our sweet potatoes are looking really, really good. Starting to vine out a little bit. Starting to try and crawl a little bit, as we can see there. I'm getting some weeds popping up here between these rows. I need to take care of these guys before they get big and try to go to seed and become a bigger issue and I need to heal these guys so I want to throw a little dirt up around them mound them up a little bit now you don't have to heal sweet potatoes but it's just something I like to do it helps with that in row weed suppression helps if you're side dressing we're going to add a little 855 fertilizer alongside the row there before we do it helps if you're fertilizing because you get to cover that fertilizer and for me it also helps me know where my rows are when this plot here just gets overgrown with vines, which it will eventually, I won't really be able to tell where my actual rows are if it's all just flat. So if I mound up around those plants, I'll be able to see those hills and then I'll know where to dig when it's harvest time. So I'm gonna get the wheel hoe with the oscillating hoe attachment. I'm gonna cultivate between these rows. Then I'm gonna side dress with some of the 855 fertilizer, some of that nature safe stuff. And then we're gonna heal it with a rake. I would do it with a wheel hoe, but the vines are already kind of crawling out a little bit. And based on where I'm going to have to put my fertilizer, I can't get the plow blades on that wheel hoe wide enough to actually cover up that fertilizer. So we're going to do it the old school way with a rake, but for these four rows, it shouldn't take long. No to be fleeting like the last breath of a sunset right before the day is dead. But maybe the heat of today could keep even winter away So I'll remember your life Cause nothing ever changes the fact That summer is for falling in love da -da 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 -da. Summer is for falling in love All right, all right, all right not a super big hill there. I don't know if you can kind of tell how high that is, but enough to kind of get some of those vines tidied up more towards the center and smother out some of those in row weeds there. Now I can't quite remember, but when I planted these and talked about my fertilization program on sweet potatoes, I may have said that I was just gonna give them that pre-plant and then some potassium later on, but I just couldn't help myself. When I'm healing something, I just feel like I got to put a little bit of fertilizer down. I've really been liking that nature safe stuff. So we put that down. We'll probably heal them one more time. I got to get me some all potassium or mainly potassium fertilizer. It will side dress them one more time with that. And I'll take my field hoe then and pull a significant amount of dirt and get a nice big heel there. Okay, cucumbers are done. Taters are dug. Sweet potatoes are healed. And now for something a lot less strenuous. It's time to pick some blackberries. Got them loaded up in there. Well, these plants, some of them look a little pitiful just because it's been so dry around here. And I got them on drip, but I just forget to water them because they're over here on the end. Well, we've had some really good harvest so far, making a lot of cobblers. Look at there, there's a leaf-footed bug. You can't see it there it goes it focused in a leaf foot bug feeding on that guy i hope he don't make it over to my tomato patch but anyway we've been enjoying these guys making cobblers i got about a quart of juice in the fridge straight juice we're gonna make jelly with and uh that's what we're gonna do with the rest of these we may have enough for one more cobbler but we're gonna use the rest of them to make jelly now you might have heard me say this before but this is a variety called arkansas prime freedom now there's a new one they came out with. I think University of Arkansas listed it. A subscriber, a viewer was telling me about it. I may have to try it. I can't remember what it was called. But I really like this variety. Before I had planted one of those varieties. There's several thornless varieties out there that are, have Native American names. There's like Apache, Arapaho, Natchez. There's several of them. And I'm not sure which one of those I had planted. But it was one of those. And it did all right, but it didn't come close to producing as many and doing as well as this Arkansas Prime Freedom has. And uh, even though it was developed in Arkansas, it seems to be able to take the South Georgia heat really well. And it's just been an awesome 
variety. It's not quite as big. The berries don't seem to be quite as big as some of those Native American types, but they do seem to be a little bit sweeter. These here are pretty, pretty tasty. So not a bumper harvest, but enough there. That's probably enough for a cobbler. What you say behind the camera lady? <laughs> I think that's enough for a cobbler. Probably enough for a cobbler. Probably not enough to make any more juice for jelly, but we got a quart jar of the juice, which should make a good bit of jelly. And that's probably about it. I don't see a whole lot of red ones left out there to get. If we get a hard hankering for more blackberries, there is a huge you pick blackberry operation. I'm talking right up the road if we just feel like we need some more. Uh, there's wild ones too. For some reason, this must be an early variety because whatever variety they have planted that commercial farm, the you pick operation, they're just now starting to pick those and these are just now finishing up. So this Arkansas Prime Freedom might be an earlier variety, who knows, but we've surely enjoyed it. And one more cobbler till next year. <laughs> okay, so the last thing, and I've been, I passed by these several times this afternoon, going back and forth from the barn to the house. So I gotta show you some of these heirloom tomatoes that are ready. Uh, they are beautiful. I've been eating a few of these German Johnsons already. Man, we've got some monsters in here. Look at that guy right there. Holy cow. That's a big tomato. That probably can stand to ripen in the house a few more days. Look at there. There's a nerdin. There's a nerdin. That one there's kind of ugly, but it'll eat. There's a nerdin. And they load it up for a, an heirloom indeterminate, which is usually pretty tough for us to grow. I have to give it to this guy here. They're not the prettiest tomatoes. Uh-oh. Well, you see that one there is pretty ugly. Real ugly. Looks like an heirloom tomato, but they taste good. There's a nice one. That was nice and ripe there. That's ready for a sandwich. Oh, come here. Come here. Let me show you. I've been waiting on this guy for a long time. Everybody says these are some of the best eating tomatoes. I can get it off there without damaging it. Ah, oh, look at that. It's called a Kellogg's breakfast tomato. Man, that thing's huge. These supposed to have a little kind of a citrusy flavor to them. That's gonna be good. We got a few smaller ones right here. That one's got some end rod on it. That one there looks pretty good too. Uh-oh. <laughs> Pulled a few too many off. That'd be all right. That one there's worth, if that's all we got off this one plant, it would be worth it. Do you want some tomatoes? <laughs> oh, okay. So nice little beautiful tomato haul there. And my determinate tomatoes are starting to put on. I can see a bunch of those ready. We're gonna have to do a mast harvest on those within the next day or so. Hopefully we'll be able to get that on camera and we can talk about comparing some of those varieties. Although I'm not seeing a whole lot of difference between the varieties, they're all doing pretty good. But if we see any differences, size or anything like that, we'll be sure to let you know. As far as those potatoes go, if you've grown that Viking potato and compared it to a more standard, older red variety like Pontiac, Red Norland, Red Lesotho, let me know what your results were. Obviously our, result, our results were pretty conclusive with the Viking being a lot more productive, but if you've tried both side by side, let me know how your experiment turned out. And let me know how you enjoy this style of video where it's just follow me around doing different tasks in the garden, no real general theme to the video. We're trying a lot of different styles of video here on this new channel just seeing what different people like so let me know how you like these kind of vlog styles just follow me around the garden as opposed to a video that has a specific purpose and if you enjoyed this one make sure you subscribe ring the bell like and share and we'll see you next time right here at lazy dog farm just a little music along with this would be very cute uh oh travis look at that oh well mm -hmm. by the beauty of your life